good evening. My name's Dale Bracken and I'm a partner of Clayton Utes. I'm also a member of the firm's International Arbitration Group. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Clayton Utes and University of Sydney International Arbitration Lecture. 2019 marks the 18th year of this lecture, but this is the first time that this lecture has been held in Brisbane to coincide with Arbitration Week. Aside from our speaker, Professor Doug Jones, I'm pleased to be joined today by Justice Andrew Greenwood. Justice Greenwood was appointed to the Federal Court of Australia in 2005 after a successful career as a solicitor. He was a partner of Minter Ellison, practising mainly in commercial litigation, intellectual property and competition law. He since had a distinguished career on the bench and is now one of the most senior judges of this court. We're honoured by his presence today. On behalf of, the, of Clayton Utes and the University of Sydney, uh, please join with me in welcoming Justice Andrew Greenwood to introduce Doug. Thank you very much, uh, Dale. Um, our guest speaker tonight is Professor Doug Jones, AO. I will introduce him uh, shortly, but you know, of course, that his topic tonight is uh, arbitration in Australia rising to the challenge. And in that context, I think it's worth just observing that the view that you have of a country or of an institution, or for that matter, of yourself, is very largely a function of the horizon you look to. So if you don't look to a big horizon, then you're likely to circumscribe the scope of the view you have about yourself or your institution or your country and the opportunities that might present otherwise themselves for you. Um, we know that in this country, of course, uh, some considerable time ago, regional rivalry was responsible for locating Canberra, where it is between Sydney and Melbourne. And we know that we have six states and two territories and a federal government in our federation and we thus have a plurality of national and regional interests to accommodate. And yet, we have major cross-border transnational and commercial projects critical to the country, which inevitably are going to give rise to disputes between investors and participants in those projects. And we simply have to have a system of resolving those disputes in a way that serves the national interest in the context of cross-border dispute resolution. And so in that context, we of course have the Commonwealth legislation um, in relation to international disputes. And we have normative choices in that legislation which makes it plain uh, that the Parliament has given full force and voice and effect to the role of arbitration and the role of the resolution uh, by arbitration of uh, international commercial disputes and in particular that legislation recognises normatively the role of the New York Convention and the model law. And so these things are things that Doug is going to talk to us tonight about in the context of trying to come to grips with what is the rising challenge that we have to face in this country in the context of arbitration in Australia. Now, Doug Jones is a leading international commercial investor state arbitrator and an international judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court. You know, of course, that that court was established in uh, January 2015. Doug has experience in both ad hoc and institutional commercial arbitrations under the uh, AAA, Akika, ASMIN, uh, UNCITRAL and many other international rules governing um, those forums. He sits regularly as an arbitrator in London, in addition to many other jurisdictions from Singapore to California, Dubai to Kuala Lumpur. He has also acted as counsel and mediator in numerous ADR procedures in infrastructure and related disputes. So far as the market sectors are concerned, Doug has been involved in arbitrations concerning infrastructure, energy, commodities, intellectual property, commercial transactions, joint ventures, and investor state disputes spanning over 30 jurisdictions around the world. Amounts in dispute in these arbitrations in which Doug has acted has literally been in excess of billions of US dollars. Doug was appointed to, to uh, as an international judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court recently in 2019 and will shortly be sworn in. 
for the period, as I understand it, 1 November 2019 to 4 January 2021. Doug is very well known to this audience. He's published and spoken extensively on these topics. He has an office in Sydney and uh, offices in London, the UK, t uh, Toronto as well. And so um, I ask and invite Doug, Doug to come and address this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge, for your introduction. Um, it is a great honour to be asked to deliver this lecture this year in Brisbane. Having been associated with the creation uh, and development of the lecture over the last 17 years, and knowing the many distinguished persons who have delivered it, I consider it a privilege to follow in their footsteps. For me, it is a special pleasure to be giving this lecture in Brisbane, where I commenced my legal career and practice for 20 years before moving to Sydney. In the last century, until, I guess, the 1980s, international arbitration was confined to a select few seats in the Northern Hemisphere. The concentration of business centres such as London, Paris, Stockholm, Switzerland and New York supported the development of successful arbitral seats. However, with the rapid growth of an interconnected global economy and the rise of regionalism, international dispute resolution has to develop to meet the demand of shifting trade flows resulting in international commercial arbitration serving Asia's booming economies. This global marketplace presents attractive opportunities for Australian practitioners for an interesting and indeed lucrative stream of work, in addition to providing the obvious economic and political benefits for Australia uh, as a seat uh, for arbitration. Australia has made significant efforts to promote and enhance international arbitration and is now well positioned as a leading arbitral seat. It has robust modern legislation, a supportive judiciary, a well-functioning arbitral institution, outstanding international arbitration legal expertise, quite a bit of which is here tonight, uh, and is a safe and accessible seat. Despite this, it is yet to meaningfully establish itself as a potential international dispute resolution hub. There are clear challenges which remain in a competitive environment arising from concerns of the impracticability of arbitrating uh, and litigating in Australia. These include perceptions of Australia's geographic isolation and its fragmented legal framework across the states and territories. It will be my suggestion that these barriers can be overcome by addressing these perceptions and through a concerted effort to develop the complete package of international dispute resolution services. In a world-class international arbitration landscape, comprised of an attractive Australian commercial law and a commercial court specifically catering towards international disputes, we can be liberated from the twin tyrannies of distance and division. I propose to address the challenges ahead for the development of international arbitration in Australia in two parts in this lecture. First, I will discuss the development of the law of arbitration in Australia, increasing judicial support and the local institutions that have been driving the growth of international arbitration over recent years. With that background, I will then turn to future challenges and look ahead to what may be achieved by and for the next generation of international arbitration practitioners in Australia. There is further work to be done to enhance Australia's attractiveness as a dispute resolution hub. I suggest two solutions that can combat these challenges. The development of an Australian commercial law for use by international parties and an international commercial court capable of applying this law. Ultimately, only by offering a complete framework for international disputes can Australia truly compete 
for international dispute resolution work in the future. To mark its centenary, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators developed what is called the London Principles. These are not comprehensive rules, but they are a set of guiding principles or key characteristics that make a seat an appropriate and effective forum in which to conduct international arbitration. The London Principles were intended to provide encouragement to existing and new seats for international arbitration by identifying the characteristics necessary for a safe and attractive arbitral seat. The characteristics identified were the law, the judiciary, legal expertise, education, right of representation, accessibility and safety, facilities, ethics, enforceability and immunity. Of course, the choice of a seat is of critical importance as it establishes the applicable arbitration law and sets the framework in relation to the challenging and enforcement of arbitral awards. I propose to outline the Australian position in the context of a number of these principles. Starting with the first and arguably one of the most critical principles, the law. By the law, I refer to whether there is an effective international arbitration law that facilitates the fair and just resolution of disputes through arbitration, limits court intervention and strikes an appropriate balance between confidentiality and transparency. In 1985, the United Nations established the model law for international commercial arbitration, which we all call the model law, which provided countries with a robust and effective framework for the regulation of international arbitration. Australia was one of the first countries to adopt the model law through the enactment of the International Arbitration Amendment Act of 1989, which incorporated the model law provisions in Schedule 2 of the International Arbitration Act 1974. When Trial revised the model law in 2006 and in 2010, amendments were made uh, in Australia to the International Arbitration Act, which adopted nearly all of those revisions. It can thus be seen that the Commonwealth Government has made a long-standing commitment to the development of international commercial arbitration. The enhancement of the International Arbitration Act continued over the years through many amendments, of which I will refer only to some recent changes. In 2015, key amendments were introduced which confirmed that confidentiality in international arbitration applies on an opt-out basis, effectively reversing the decision of the High Court in Esso and Plowman, to which I will return later. The amendments also improved enforceability by providing for uh, the enforcement of international awards made in jurisdictions not party to the New York Convention by Australian courts. Most recently, in late 2018, the Commonwealth Parliament introduced amendments that incorporated the UNCITRAL rules on transparency, uh, clarifying requirements for enforcing foreign awards and gave arbitrators more flexibility in awarding costs. These amendments strike a balance between preserving confidentiality in commercial arbitration while increasing <coughs> the legitimacy of investor state dispute resolution. They have maintained the consistency of Australian law with international best practice. In order to understand the law governing arbitration in Australia, it is important to recognise uh, that Australia as a constitutional federation gives to the Commonwealth Parliament the power to legislate for international arbitration and to the states the power to legislate for domestic arbitration. Despite this separation of constitutional responsibility, Australia has done well to ensure uniformity to a large degree between its domestic and international regimes. Previously, the states were reluctant to reform what was then existing uniform domestic arbitration law. However, in 2009, in a bold move, the Standing Committee of Attorneys General agreed to adopt a series of uniform commercial arbitration acts based on the model law for the domestic arbitration regimes of the states. 
These acts were enacted in all states and territories, starting with New South Wales in 2010 and finishing with the ACT in 2017. Thus, despite the separation of powers in relation to legislation concerning arbitration, Australia is in a special position amongst federations of having the same legislative regime for both domestic and international arbitration based on the UNCTRAL model law. It is interesting to note the different approaches taken by major economies uh, to uh, arbitration uh, on the one hand, uh, domestic arbitration on one hand, and international arbitration on the other. Take, for example, uh, uh, the system in the US, in which the Federal Arbitration Act, unreformable due to the politics associated with class actions, uh, which is not based on the model law, governs some domestic uh, and international arbitration proceedings. And all 50 states have adopted their own arbitration statutes for domestic arbitration with only some of these states adopting a model law model. Similarly, in Canada, all provinces and territories aside from Quebec have enacted separate statutes for domestic and international arbitrations with only the international arbitration regimes incorporating the model law has to have two qualities when it comes to the courts. An experienced judiciary capable of dealing with matters relating to international arbitration and courts that respect the party's choice to refer their disputes to arbitration by adopting a non-interventionist approach to enforcing awards. This principle is succinctly stated in Article 5 of the Model Law, which provides in matters governed by this law, no court shall intervene except where so provided in this law. While this is an issue with some which some jurisdictions still have problems grappling with, Australian courts are at the leading edge when it comes to judicial support for arbitration. First, in most jurisdictions, specialist judges deal with matters relating to international arbitration. A particular example of this can be seen in the federal court. Similarly, the Supreme Court of New South Wales, which championed reform to the Uniform Domestic Act, has jurisdiction to deal with all arbitration matters, international and domestic, offering parties a specialised commercial arbitration list in its equity division. Earlier this year, in Queensland, the Uniform Civil Procedure Amendment Rule amended the UCPR to incorporate harmonised rules for international and commercial arbitration. The creation of specialist lists and harmonised practices for arbitration assures parties that their commercial arbitration matters will be dealt with efficiently and fairly by arbitration experienced judges. It also affords the parties greater certainty and predictability. As the Honourable Justice Clyde Croft said, one of the benefits of the arbitration list is that a consistent body of arbitration-related decisions will be developed by a single judge or a group of judges. This should provide parties with greater certainty when judicial intervention or support is required. The Australian judiciary's support of arbitration is also obvious outside the courtroom with the Federal Court of Australia hosting this lecture for many years and an international arbitration lecture series alongside the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Indeed, the Chief Justice of the Federal Court, the Honourable James Alsop, is a staunch supporter of international arbitration and an intellectual leader in this area and many others uh, within the Australian judiciary. He's also the chair of Akika's Judicial Liaison Committee. This brings me to the second quality relating to courts, judicial support for arbitration demonstrated by jurisprudence. Australian judges have commented on the shift of Australian courts towards a significantly more positive pro-arbitration position. The court's former apprehensions concerning arbitration stemming from historical tension between judges and arbitrators are a thing of the past. 
1995, a controversial Australian decision on confidentiality became internationally notorious. Esso and Plowman. In that case, the High Court expressed views about confidentiality which were the subject of vigorous and often negative debate in the international arbitral community. However, as time has passed and as issues of transparency have become far more important in international commercial dispute resolution, many have realised that the Australian High Court decision has considerable merit. This is not the place to debate the merits of confidentiality and transparency, but merely to note that the recent amendments to the Arbitration Act uh, have made the debate in Australia moot in any event, as confidentiality now applies on an opt-out basis. Australian courts have, through numerous decisions, created an environment that strongly supports the process of international and domestic arbitration. The non-interventionist attitude of Australian courts is evident in the decision of TCL air conditioner, uh, in which the High Court upheld the constitutionality of the International Arbitration Act and confirmed the court's inability to refuse enforcement of an arbitral award for error of law. There are numerous Australian decisions that confirm the, thr the high threshold for setting aside or denying enforcement of arbitral awards. There is also no general discretion to refuse enforcement in Australia uh, and the public policy ground for refusing enforcement under the International Arbitration Act is interpreted narrowly and without residual discretion. Similar approaches exist with respect to the interpretation of arbitration agreements. Australian courts have held that arbitration clauses are to be construed flexibly and liberally confirmed by the Federal Court's decision in Commandant Marine. The Court's pro-arbitration approach uh, can be seen in the recent decision uh, of Reinhardt and Hancock prospecting, in which the High Court construed the relevant arbitration clause, uh, having regard to its language and context, to capture disputes relating to the validity of the arbitration clause. Admittedly, as mentioned by uh, Justice Keane in his opening address to the conference on Monday. While the issue of the conflicting approaches to interpretation under the Reinhardt and Weckler and Fiona Trust cases was unfortunately not finally decided, the decision confirms that Australian courts will construe arbitration clauses broadly. Finally, the federal court case of Uganda Telecom where Mr Justice Foster identified the enforcement of arbitral awards as the key rationale of Australian public policy. Courts have recognised that discrete parts of awards infected by a breach of procedural fairness may be severed from the balance of the award. The courts can then enforce that part of the award uh, which is uninfected, preventing the entirety from being void. It's therefore evident that the enforceability of awards, another London principle, is clearly adhered to in Australia. It is safe to assume that what Mr Justice Foster described as a pro-enforcement bias towards the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards will continue. The Australian judiciary has demonstrated its clear support for the practice and procedure of international domestic arbitration in a manner wholly consistent with the London principles. In addition to a legislative framework and supportive judiciary, Australia has the necessary facilities and infrastructure in place to support arbitration, driven largely by the practitioners themselves. When discussing facilities, I'm referring firstly to access to leading arbitral institutions with modern rules, and second, world-class facilities that ensure the smooth conduct of proceedings and the administration of international arbitrations. It is safe to say that these are features possessed by AKICA, the Australian Centre for International Commercial Arbitration. To provide some history, in 2001, the International Bar Association held its annual arbitration day in Sydney, which was a far more modest event than they are nowadays. But this event provided a catalyst 
for reviving Akika. A coalition of senior practitioners from a number of the national firms joined with the then president of a largely moribund Akika to revitalise the institution and transform it into a truly effective international arbitration institution. These practitioners included the late Keith Steele of Freehill, Hollingdale and Page, now Herbert Smith Freehills, David Fairley of Mallison's Stephen Jakes, now King and Wood Mallison's, Tim Lestrange, then of Allen's Arthur Robinson, and now after a period as a banker, uh, a partner in Melbourne of Jones Day, and me uh, in Clayton Utes. Akika introduced arbitration rules in 2005, which were revised in 2011 and 2016. These revisions included provisions for emergency arbitrators and expedited arbitration. Akika's commitment to ongoing reform ensures arbitration in Australia remains consistent with international best practice. Australia also offers excellent infrastructure to, to support international arbitration in world-class facilities. After Akika's revival, with the support of the then Attorneys General, the Honourable John Hasistagos in New South Wales, and the Honourable Robert McClellan of the Commonwealth, the Australian Dispute Centre was established in Sydney. The ADC works closely with Akika to provide a venue with all the features of the best dispute resolution centres that can be customised to the needs of arbitration to maximise cost effectiveness for the parties. In recent years, the flourishing of international dispute resolution associated with the resources industry saw the establishment of the Perth Centre for Energy and Resources Arbitration, PSIRA, which has been established to promote Australia as a place for the resolution of resources disputes. It is truly gratifying and encouraging to see PSIRA now working under the Akika umbrella to promote international arbitration as a national, rather than just a Western Australian, endeavour. Meeting the challenge faced by federations such as Australia with far-fung places and regional interests is one that calls for a national vision and persistent effort in order to succeed, and I will return to that topic. Also associated with Akika is a specialist commission, the Australian Maritime and Transport Arbitration Commission, which is established, again, under the umbrella of Akika for the development of international commercial arbitration uh, in maritime and transport issues. So you have now the Akika umbrella specialist uh, divisions which deal with resources arbitration and maritime arbitration. The shared objective of these organisations is to further arbitration within Australia and has resulted in high quality service and facilities for the use of commercial parties. Thus, so far as facilities and institutions are concerned, Australia satisfies the London principles. Successful seats for arbitration have to be home to skilled and experienced legal practitioners who are able to administer and provide support for international arbitration. The high quality of Australian lawyers is amply demonstrated by their successes and prominence uh, as uh, practitioners uh, in all of the major common law jurisdictions in the world and many civil law jurisdictions as well. Recent times, however, have seen the establishment of international arbitration practices with the international and domestic firms in Australia. Examples in include firms such as Cause, King and Wood Mallisons, Herbert Smith Freehills, Clayton Utes, Allens, Ashurst, Baker Mackenzie, DLA Piper, Clifford Chance, Allen and Overy, HFW, Norton Rose, Clyde and Co, White and Case, and Jones Day. For there to be such an interest by these firms in the practice of international arbitration in Australia is a testament to the number of positive characteristics that Australia possesses. First, the practice of law in Australia is much more open to international practitioners than in some other jurisdictions. 
Law firms practicing international commercial dispute resolution have the capacity to operate both in the domestic courts here and in international arbitration. And that cannot be said of a number of other prominent jurisdictions in our region. Secondly, the cost to legal practitioners and firms of operating in Australia is lower than in a number of other leading centres in our region. Australia provides a very economically sustainable base from which international arbitration practices can develop. As these firms continue to practice and grow in Australia, the financial interest they will have in seating arbitrations in Australia is obvious. The state bars have had a continuing interest in the growth of international arbitration as attested by the corporate membership of the New South Wales and Victorian bars in Akika. And there's been a recent revival of interest by the Australian Bar Association in the development of the practice of international commercial arbitration, no doubt encouraged by the number of international arbitral disputes which have been spawned by the oil and gas and mining disputes arising in recent times due to changing economic conditions in those industries. At the recent Australian Bar Association conference in Singapore, a debate took place on increasing opportunities for Australian barristers to practice international disputes, which had been the subject of a report uh, by the Honourable Roger Giles. This discussion was significant in furthering the interests of the Australian Bar in developing a competitive practice in Australia and more importantly, in the Asia Pacific region. The skills of Australian dispute resolution practitioners interested in international arbitration, including those from the independent bars of the states and territories, is equal to that of the London Bar, whose capacity to win work in the region has been and continues to be demonstrated regularly. Some Australian barristers are also associated with overseas chambers in England or Singapore. Indeed, a group of prominent barristers from Sydney and Brisbane have taken chambers in Maxwell Suites in Singapore to create what is called Maxwell 42, specialising in international arbitration. And I hear there is a movement by some from the Victorian Bar to take a similar course. Thus, I suggest that Australia is not only well placed to be an effective centre for international commercial arbitration, it is in many respects uniquely so placed. It can safely be said, in my view, that Australia satisfies all the other criteria of the London principles, indicating that it is a safe and attractive seat. But let me mention just a few more of those principles here. Education. Closely linked with the competency of the legal profession is education, another of the London principles. Educational institutions providing undergraduate and postgraduate study in international arbitration proliferate in Australia, with many leading Australian universities providing courses in international commercial arbitration, including one of the hosts of this lecture, the University of Sydney. The Resolution Institute provides arbitrator accreditation and training in Australia, run in conjunction with the University of Adelaide Law School. In terms of practical experience, Akika offers an internship program for law students or law graduates with an interest in commercial arbitration. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Australia also provides a number of training courses for accreditation and professional development, as well as an Asia-Pacific diploma in international arbitration. The involvement of Australian universities in the William C. Viss moot has been long and sustained, and the success enjoyed by Australian teams in the Viz has been consistent. In recent years, the Australian Catholic University Monash University, the University of New South Wales, the University of Queensland and the University of Sydney all have received honourable mentions. And the University of Sydney was awarded the Peter Sanders Award for Best Claimant Memorandum this year. 
In addition, a number of international arbitration moots are also available to Australian students, including the Alfred Deakin International Commercial Arbitration Moot and the Chartered Institute New South Wales Young Lawyers International Arbitration Moot. It's therefore safe to say that the education offered in the area of international arbitration in Australia is widespread and of a high quality. Another of the London principles is the right of representation. The entitlement of parties to be represented by their council of choice in international arbitration is enshrined in Commonwealth legislation. Section 29.2 of the International Act provides that a party may appear in person before an arbitral tribunal and be represented by himself or herself, by a duly qualified legal practitioner from any jurisdiction of that party's choice, or by any other person of that party's choice, thus avoiding any of the debate about the right to practice law in Australia, either as a solicitor or a barrister. So in summary, it's clear that Australia satisfies all of the London principles. Collectively, the prevalence of these characteristics in Australia makes this country a safe and effective dis place for arbitration uh, for disputing parties in the Asia Pacific. Nevertheless, arbitration in Australia has not reached its full potential. One would assume that given the prevalence of these characteristics and more international arbitrations would be seated in Australia than presently are. There are several reasons for this. These re represent the challenges that remain to be overcome to ensure the continued growth of international arbitration in Australia in a highly competitive international market. Further developments must be made to enhance Australia's potential as an international dispute resolution hub. So this brings me to the challenges that lie ahead. In exploring the future of commercial arbitration in Australia, we must ask, what can practitioners, legislators and judges do to raise the profile of Australia as a regional hub for international disputes. The challenges I will focus on today are threefold. First, the tyranny of distance. Second, <coughs> regional rivalries within our federation. And finally, Australia's fragmented legal framework. What becomes clear from this discussion, I hope, will be that some of these challenges are misconceptions about Australia that need correction, while others will require significant effort on the part of Australia's legal community. I propose to raise two potential avenues for advancement, an Australian commercial law and an international commercial court. My, my intention in doing so is to contribute to the conversation on these issues, which has been around for some time. A more detailed roadmap must, however, await another occasion. The tyranny of distance, a phrase coined by Blaney, has been a feature of the Australian scene since European settlement. For Blaney, it was Australia's geographic remoteness combined by a lack of attractive trade goods that left European imperial powers disinterested throughout much of the 18th century. Distance also served to isolate Australian cities from themselves before the railroads were built, making domestic trade uh, an expensive and laborious proposition. In the context of arbitration, the same brush that paints this grim picture of Australian history potentially provides a similarly pessimistic perspective on present-day Australia as a choice for an arbitral seat. But how real is this? The challenges of the geographic location of Australia, 
won't be solved in our lifetime. The continent is moving too slowly. <laughs> but the inconvenience of Australia's location that characterised its history have become considerably less pronounced. These inconveniences have been, to a large degree, ameliorated by technology and the flight connections that Australia now enjoys from its major cities to many parts of the world. Technology is reducing the need for international arbitration participants to gather physically for the purpose of procedural and substantive hearings. Many such hearings are now conducted remotely. 60% of respondents to the 2018 Queen Mary survey confirmed they often use video teleconferencing and the majority of respondents agreed that virtual hearing rooms should be used more often. Thus, physical travel to Australia for the purpose of hearings may not be as necessary as it has been in the past, thus reducing the impact of distance from which we have suffered throughout our history. When travel to and within Australia is necessary, the flight connections are numerous. The perception of Australia's isolation is worse than the reality. The travel time from New York to Sydney compares favourably to the travel time from New York to Singapore. And Qantas is soon to commence a direct flight from Chicago to Brisbane, saving six hours in the return travel time. And making a direct flight from New York to Sydney is just over the horizon, as we're told by Qantas. There are already direct flights from Dallas and Houston to Sydney, and where once there were few airline connections available, there are now many, and the introduction of non-stop flights from major centres of economic activity to Australia is expanding. Perth has taken the advantage of the direct flights now available from London, a flight which I, in fact, caught on my way to Brisbane for the beginning of International Arbitration Week. Moreover, despite Australia's location, Evidence shows that the cost of arbitrating in Australia, including administration fees, professional fees and the cost of facilities, make any additional time and cost of travel to reach Australia quite competitive in comparison with other seats in the region, such as Singapore and Hong Kong. Thus, the relevance of the tyranny of distance has faded and will, in my opinion, continue to fade justifying the effort to change perceptions in the promotion of international arbitration in Australia. As the Honourable Roger Giles said in his report to the ABA, geography cannot be changed, but hopefully perceptions can be. These perceptions needed to be, need to be addressed head on, admitted and dealt with. They cannot be ignored if Australia is to meet its challenge. The next challenge regional rivalries and the problem of competing voices in our federal system. The regional rivalries of the states are well known to all of us. But the success of international arbitration in Australia and international dispute work more generally depends on pursuing it as a national initiative. When the major law firms came together to promote international arbitration and revive Akika, the national character of the law firms was a critical part of this development. By that time, firms had joined together in national-wide partnerships. This brought the national business needs of these law firms to the forefront and reduced regional jealousies. Of course, although this occurred in law firms, no similar change could occur in the state bars, sadly. However, the fact that this annual event, Australian Arbitration Week, has been now held in Perth, Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane is a testament to the commitment of those involved in the development of international arbitration to be as inclusive as possible. And it's worth recognising that equivalent federations have all failed to meet this challenge. One has only to look at the competitive approaches of the various regions in the United States, Canada, 
India and indeed Switzerland to see how difficult it is to avoid division in the successful promotion of diverse nations as centres for international arbitration. Where the population and economy are also large, such as in the US, it may be possible to promote several centres, such as New York, Miami, Atlanta, Houston, Los Angeles and San Francisco, to the limited benefit of each. But it's simply not a reality to which we can aspire in Australia. Our economy is not large enough and the cake is not big enough. We must all work together as Australians to promote Australia as the venue for international arbitration and thus allow the facilities available in all of our major economic centres to benefit. Prioritising our, our national interests over regional interests will prove crucial in ensuring the development of international arbitration in Australia. Initially, the promotion of Australia was concentrated through the lens of Sydney. While Sydney remains a major centre of professional activity, as is this city, Perth and Melbourne, equally so. We need to focus on finding ways to increase the pie rather than the shares of it so that we can all enjoy the benefit of that pie. But the regional rivalries of courts and laws also present challenges. When the International Arbitration Act was amended in 2006 and 2010, debate arose over the whether jurisdiction over arbitration should be vested in the Supreme Courts of each state, the Federal Court, or all of them. This was a bruising experience for those involved and I can speak personally in that respect. The state chief justices sprang into action and established a working group to oppose exclusive jurisdiction to be given to the federal court. Section 18 of the International Arbitration Act is a product of their efforts, with supervisory jurisdiction for international arbitration vested in the state and territory supreme courts as well as the federal court. This outcome is still controversial and perhaps cannot be regarded as finally settled. There is, however, a broader issue that bears upon Australia being regarded as an obvious choice for international commercial dispute resolution. There is a symbiotic character between the development of international arbitration and the development of court dispute resolution for international commercial disputes. For example, in London, the relationship between the commercial court and international arbitration is close. Each supports the other. Indeed, approximately 25% of the claims before the international, before the English commercial court relate to matters arising out of arbitration. Further, 70% of the English commercial court's caseload are international cases, demonstrating international parties' preference for English law or for English courts as the forum, or both. This is a situation that Australian courts must emulate, noting, however, the obvious advantages that London possesses, its history as a commercial hub for centuries and its ability to offer uh, English law uh, is an advantage uh, perhaps enhanced rather than adversely impacted by Brexit. However, one feature that could be emulated in Australia is that of the combined benefit uh, of international arbitration and a commercial court capable of handling international disputes and, of course, an attractive unified law. This symbiotic relationship is another method through which courts contribute to the development of international dispute resolution. And so this brings me to my final topic, the need for Australia to transcend its state and territory borders to create an Australian commercial law and an international commercial court. I have long been an advocate for the development of an international commercial law in Australia. In the international arbitrations in which I have sat, I have seen a clear trend towards parties selecting a law that is neutral 
predictable and commercially logical, such as Singaporean law, Swiss law or English law, for transactions that have nothing to do with those countries. Singapore and England offer experienced judges, efficient court systems and a high quality of justice and are therefore no different to Australia in that regard. However, where Australia falls short is the perception of the applicable law as fragmented. Having tried to promote the adoption of Australian law in my days as a transactional lawyer in international projects, I've failed to interest international parties in a debate about whether one should adopt the law of New South Wales, Victoria, Western Australia, Queensland, or some other state or territory. International parties are simply not interested in that debate. They think, until corrected by Australian lawyers, that there's a law of Australia. We have the problem, which we share with the United States and Canada, of where the law of the states and provinces is the relevant law that must be chosen. Australia's federal legal system deters parties from selecting Australian law. What then should be done about this? One idea that has been suggested as a means of transcending state and territory borders is to apply Australian common law rather than the laws of a particular state. And in the landmark case of Longy and the Australian Broadcasting Commission, the High Court said, there is but one common law in Australia which is declared by this court as the final court of appeal. In contrast to the position in the United States, the common law as it exists throughout the Australian states and territories is not fragmented into different systems of jurisprudence, possessing different content and subject to different authoritative interpretations. And true that is, the position in the US is truly diverse. But this simple solution of adopting Australian common law is unlikely to solve the issue of fragmentation. The interpretation of the common law of Australia actually differs across states and is often reflective of state and territory statutory law. Take, for example, the contract law question, simple one, of whether ambiguity is a threshold issue on which admissibility of extrinsic evidence turns. In New South Wales, it's not necessary to demonstrate the existence of ambiguity without, before you look at extrinsic evidence, but in Western Australia, the case law indicates that it is necessary there. That discrepancy will continue until it's resolved by the High Court and the common law of Australia declared. There is, of course, even greater diversity in state and territory statutes. The east-west coast divide in the security payments regime uh, is just one example of that. For international parties unfamiliar with these nuances, choosing a state or territory law is neither simple nor desirable. Transactional lawyers are not law reformers, but creators of contracts, the interpretation of which they hope can be confidently predicted. The choice currently offered is the law of a particular state, presenting all of the undesirable competitive tensions between practitioners of the states. In my view, it would be delusional for any particular state to aspire to the status of New York, which certainly enjoys amongst US states a clear choice of law advantage. The introduction of an Australian commercial law for international contracts is the only effective option to create the first of the building blocks that I suggest. A law international parties can adopt for transactions unrelated to Australia with ease and able to be applied with certainty. In devising this body of law, it is worth considering whether the Australian consumer law should be included, given that it has been identified as a deterrent for international parties considering the choice of any branch of Australian law. Of course, some provisions of the ACL can be excluded, but the mandatory provisions, importantly those prohibiting misleading or deceptive conduct, will continue to apply even in circumstances where an Australian branch of the law is not the applicable law. The risk of an, a potential ACL claim being brought presents uncertainty that cautious commercial parties would seek to avoid. And this is an is issue that should be given careful consideration in the development of any Australian commercial law. 
the value of a uniform body of Australian law and of an international commercial court have been raised by prominent members of the Australian judiciary and warrant further serious consideration amongst the legal profession as a whole. It is my suggestion that, Australian, that an Australian commercial law would address international commercial parties' reluctance to choose Australian law in their contracts and thus enhance the possibility of disputes being resolved in Australia to interpret the Australian commercial law. It would also prevent the bleeding out of Australian-based projects to other jurisdictions for dispute resolution, which is an unfortunate but common occurrence, notwithstanding the fact that the parties or the project itself uh, is closely connected with Australia. Absent a widely accepted branch of state or territory law, which is unlikely to emerge, there needs to be a cooperative approach between the states and the Commonwealth that can be supported by all stakeholders without it being perceived as a threat to any one of them. If parties could select a unified Australian commercial law as their substantive law, it follows that they would be more inclined to select Australian courts or arbitrations seated in Australia to apply this law. And this brings me to my final suggestion that Australia establish an international commercial court. The topic has divided the Australian community, legal community, in recent years, in my view a little surprisingly. Um, despite the emergence in the last decade of international commercial courts in Singapore, Dubai, China, Kazakhstan, Netherlands, Qatar and Abu Dhabi, many prominent members of the Australian judiciary are proponents for such a court, including Chief Justice Alsop of this court, uh, the former Chief Justice Warren of the Victorian Supreme Court and Justice Croft, to name a few. But there are also opponents of an Australian International Commercial Court, most recently the Honourable Justice Andrew Bell, the President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, uh, who presented a paper at the Australian Bar Association conference in Singapore earlier this year. While it's recognised that fleshing out a roadmap for implementing an Australian International Commercial Court is beyond the scope of this lecture, it's my view that the implementation of this proposal is critical to ensuring Australia's regional competitiveness as a place for international commercial dispute resolution. The purpose of an Australian ICC is to provide international parties with choice of an alternative forum to international arbitration, with a specialised focus on international commercial law. It's not intended to replace or undermine the excellent work of the Australian judiciary who effectively and efficiently resolve commercial disputes. Indeed, the recognised intellectual competence and independence of the Australian judiciary is the reason for Australia's potential to become a leading dispute resolution hub. I support the comments of Justice Craig, uh, Craig Colvin earlier this year that it, an Australian ICC is an opportunity that arises by reason of the quality of Australia's judicial system. A new forum may be required, he said, for Australia to participate fully in that opportunity. Equally, such a court would be a companion rather than a competitor to international commercial arbitration, with each filling any gaps in the services offered by the other. Ensuring Australia's judicial resources are recognised and, more importantly, used as an option for regional international dispute resolution cannot be done effectively through the commercial lists of the Australian state and territory courts. The same challenge exists in relation to exclusive choice of court agreements designating Australia. While these are recognised and enforced in Australia, the challenge is encouraging commercial parties to choose an Australian court in the first place. International parties do not have the appreciation of, nor enthusiasm to choose, among the qualities of particular state or territory courts, and none has achieved, or is likely to achieve, 
a sufficiently preeminent reputation such as that enjoyed to a limited degree by the New York state and federal courts to provide a compelling basis for choice. Moreover, and very importantly, the effort to achieve such a singular reputation by any one of these state courts is likely to engender the kind of internal competition that I have argued will undermine the united national purpose critical to the development of Australia as a regional international commercial dispute resolution hub. To the contrary, Australia needs a single institution operating nationally and comprised of the very best commercial talent from across the country. Of course, we do have such an institution, the Federal Court of Australia, the host of this lecture. However, at the risk of appearing an ungrateful guest, <laughs> and with all due respect to the talent on this court, it, in my view, would be a mistake to limit the commercial bench to members of this court. An Australian ICC must consist of the brightest and the best from the entire Australian judiciary, thus drawing for its membership from state and territory courts as well. Offering parties one forum, supported by all states and territories, is far more attractive than any current offering. As Australians, we cannot afford to fragment our international effort by giving into what Justice Colvin described as competitive federalism. Realising that a complete roadmap would need many more details, may I mention just two? There are constitutional challenges which need to be addressed in the creation of an Australian ICC. However, solutions can and should be found to them. We shouldn't give up before we start. Secondly, careful thought should be given to judges being sessionally appointed and compensated rather than removed from the courts to which they are primarily appointed. And the cost of the court's establishment should be limited largely to its administration, with physical facilities being shared nationally either with the federal courts or the state courts. The proliferation of international commercial courts around the world cannot be regarded as a phenomenon with a common objective. At the risk of some simplification, three categories of international commercial courts can be identified. Firstly, there are those established and being established in Europe seeking to draw work away from London as a result of Brexit. I call these the Brexit wannabes. Secondly, regional international commercial courts in the Middle East and Central Asia seek to offer an English common law style of justice and procedure to those trading in those regions who lack confidence in the effectiveness of local courts. The third category are the real international commercial courts which form an integral part of an existing state court system based in centres of international trade whose local law is regularly adopted as a neutral law to govern contracts having no geographic connection with that country. There are only two of these, London and Singapore. To characterise the establishment of international commercial courts as a bandwagon, which some in Australia have done, misses the point that there are a variety of reasons for their establishment. The relevant reasons for an ICC in Australia is demonstrated only by the two highly successful examples that I have mentioned in my third category. My thesis is simple. Although the development of Australia as a seat and venue for international arbitration is not dependent on adopting an Australian law or establishing an Australian international commercial court. These are necessary for Australia to realise its full potential as a regional international commercial dispute centre. And the implementation of either, and certainly both, will greatly enhance the development of international arbitration in Australia. Participation by Australians in the international dispute centres in our region remains critical, of course, to the development of international dispute practices by Australian practitioners. Cooperation regionally between centres 
and courts should also be regarded as the norm. Thus, the establishment of Maxwell 42, in which several Australian barristers based in Singapore contribute to international arbitration, is a very welcome development, as is the participation of Australians as international judges uh, in the Singapore International Commercial Court. This should, however, not be considered as a substitute for pressing on with realising the potential of Australia as a regional centre for international dispute resolution. So in conclusion, although there have been many positive developments that have allowed Australian arbitration to flourish, Australia is yet to realise its potential as a hub for international dispute resolution. There is, however, a strong foundation upon which to build. When one puts Australian arbitration to the test of the London principles, it's clear that the current legal landscape is one in which international arbitration can thrive. In my view, international arbitration will benefit from increased opportunities if Australia is to be able to promote itself as a desirable forum for international dispute resolution generally. In order to position itself as an international hub, Australia needs the complete package. A robust international arbitration framework, which it has. Second, an international commercial law that parties can choose. And finally, an international commercial court. There are challenges which must be addressed and developments which ought to be pursued if Australia is to compete. As the relevance of Blaney's tyranny of distance continues to fade, accelerated by technology and the emergence of regionalism, Australian arbitration is becoming increasingly accessible. Australian regional rivalries remain, but are also diminishing and will continue to do so if the states and territories cooperate to offer an Australian commercial law and or an international commercial court. In this address, I've sought to move from the past to the future and to sketch some streams for potential development for international dispute resolution generally. This week in Brisbane is a testament to the continued debate of issues in international and domestic arbitration, which is a constant now in Australia. The activities for many years of AKIKA and the Chartered Institute in the promotion of debates on topics of interest in international arbitration uh, have been a feature of the Australian scene for some time and hopefully will remain so. It is my experience that a long-term and sustained passion for the development of international commercial arbitration in Australia is both necessary and sustainable as we move forward in the development of the practice of international dispute resolution in this country. I would encourage all of you to recommit to this passion and to sustain it. No, not from you, Roger. It's a continuing issue. It's one of the major identified challenges by respondents to the Queen Mary survey uh, in relation to arbitration. It's debated again and again, and rightly so. Um, the debate is sometimes informed and sometimes not so well informed. But for all of us who are practitioners, be it as arbitrators or as counsel, uh, it remains, it should remain as one of the guiding issues that inform the establishment of procedures that are as efficient as possible. 
Uh, and one sees in um, the competitive environment, uh, particularly in our region, uh, significant pressures, uh, particularly in relation to council costs, that are producing some quite interesting uh, outcomes, uh, the detail of which would need another lecture to raise it. But thank you. You raise a very relevant topic. Well, I said it wasn't a closed subject. <laughs> uh, I still bear the bruises of the debate. Um, the politics became really quite fraught in that debate. My own view is that you're right. We should have the federal court having exclusive jurisdiction in international arbitration, and therefore its appellate process is dealing with that. Well, I, 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 I'm not sure it's as, as difficult as that, but anyway. But your, your point is, have all the state courts... All the appeals should go to the one court, being the federal court, so they, they, uh. they don't have, as you recently had in Hancock, federal court saying, you know, this is the law in Australia, and the New South Wales court is really saying it's not the law. Yeah. That, that's not the case. Well, there's a few presidents of courts of appeal around Australia who'd have something to say about that, so the, the same debate would emerge of how dare you take away our right to hear the appeals. You've just got to be bold about this, I think, in, a, in the national interest. But you'll certainly have a lot of uh, debate from state courts, even doing your uh, more, more modest approach. I think we should be a little bolder than that myself, uh, but others will have to carry that debate. One example, um, and I'm not an advocate for doing this, um, Doug's an advocate for it, I express no view about it for the moment, but. Of course, in the intellectual property area, the states have uh, are invested with uh, jurisdiction under the Commonwealth legislation, but all appeals come to the federal court. Um, all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have had a big horizon. We've heard about the importance of the, um, the pro-enforcement bias in the federal court and the states' courts, consistent with the London principles from 2015 that we've heard about, and in my view, consistent entirely with the objects of the National Arbitration Act. Um, we've heard about the um, revitalised role of Akika and Akika's umbrella role in relation to resources and maritime arbitrations, and we've heard about the quality and range of practitioners who work in this area, um, and that's un undoubtedly, undoubtedly true. Um, the two challenges, I guess, are this whole notion of a single coherent, coherent commercial law uh, and the question of establishing an international commercial court and the composition of people who might get a commission in that court. So they're, they're the, big, uh, the big challenges. Um, I suspect that if uh, Wacom hadn't gone the way it went in 1997, there might have been a shorter road home than, uh, than is now necessary. But in any event, um, 
I just want to uh, thank you, Doug, for this stimulating, terrific address, and I'd like you to all um, recognise the quality of the address. Thank you.